Great. Hi. Um, hi, Lynn. Um, and hi, Rosa. Um, so if you're viewing this, you are viewing the, um, the arts, uh, pursuing a creative career presentation. And um, I'll introduce myself and then let other folks introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Anne Lepore, and I am the Assistant Director for uh, Career Education at Willamette University. So I work with students on the Willamette campus um, and also via Zoom work with students at PNCA as well. Um, so I'm one of the career advisors and do a lot of work with students who are interested in, in creative careers. Lynn? Hello, my name is Lynn Brown and I'm the Director of the Talent Hub at PNCA in Portland as part of Willamette University. And um, I've been doing this particular job for three years, but prior to that, I was a career advisor at Merrillhurst University and worked with um, many students interested in creative jobs. So this is a, a really strong interest of mine and I'm really happy to be here today. So Rosa, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, sure. Hi, my name is Rosa Wang. I am a visual artist and independent art and meditation teacher and creativity coach. And I'm really here just to listen and learn and um, find out what you all are doing um, at Willamette and PNCA as far as um, the career development side of things. Thank you, Rosa. So, thanks for having me here. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will dive into the presentation. All right, hopefully everybody can see that. All right, um, so I will just kind of minimize that for the moment. Um, so again, I'm Anne and um, I'm gonna take us through the first couple of slides and then turn things over to Lynn for a bit. So, um, here we are in the Willamette campus in this picture, but um, but know that there's plenty of folks that um, may view this that are from PNCA Yay. as well. Um, so we've already introduced ourselves, um, Lynn and myself, and we work closely together. Um, I wish more in person than we get to sometimes, but um, we do work closely together uh, talking about the kinds of students that we both see, both of, both of us see students that are really interested in creative and artistic careers. So, we're gonna start by, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about we're gonna, what we're gonna cover in this presentation. So um, I love this cartoon that, that Lynn sent <laughs> to me this week. So uh, we're expecting you to return as a rich and successful artist. So um, we know that a lot of students get, get worried about this. They get worried about um, how can I have the creative and artistic career I want and also have a career that feels stable, feels secure, feels um, like something that, um, that they can feel stimulated by and excited by for a really long time. And um, that also um, makes them feel like they're in a stable place too. So that's what we're gonna hopefully talk about today. Uh, so we're gonna talk about what we mean by what even is a creative career. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about career development as a whole and how you figure out what it is you might wanna pursue in your life. We're gonna talk about some examples of creative careers, what those might look like. It's definitely beyond um, really just the stereotypical, like an artist, like that's certainly one creative career, but there's a lot of room for interpretation there. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the different ways that that can look. And then we'll also talk briefly about how to pursue those different paths. So some resources, creative resumes, and that kind of thing. So I'm going to pull myself back up here a little bit just so I can see things. Okay. So, okay. So let's do a, a brief reality check. Um, so I think sometimes when students hear the word artist, uh, they are picturing something a little about a little bit like that guy on the left, um, something that looks like kind of it came straight out of La Boheme or something. So um, you've got somebody who is artistic and a thinker and a reader and a writer and maybe an artist of some kind. But 
you know, is having trouble maybe paying the bills or something like that. When in reality, that's a, that's a pretty outdated really image of what a creative artistic career looks like. Um, and what we hope that you can think a little bit more about is something that looks closer to this picture on the right. Um, this is only one example of a creative career. There's, I could have chosen any number of images to represent what a creative career in a modern context looks like. Um, but you can see that in this picture, um, this person is surrounded by color and creativity and ideas. And, um, and there's, there are a lot of places where you can find that kind of work these days. So fear not, it's not the pit one picture. Um, it can very much be a reality that you're, that you're excited about. Okay, and um, so now talking a little bit about what even makes something a creative career, what does that even mean? And I'm gonna let um, Lynn take over for a second and talk about what, what do we even mean by a creative career? I'm kind of reflecting on the last um, two, two images on the previous slide because when I talked to my supervisor, Mandy, about our ideas for this workshop, she said, oh, I think the whole thing should just be busting the, the myth about um, the starving artist. And um, I think implicit in, in this conversation, just as Anne said, is that isn't, that isn't the reality now. And um, I think the, the very real intention of this workshop is to show you how um, creativity does not mean low pay. So this idea of being creative can mean many different things. Um, you also don't have to um, complete a degree at an art school to work in a creative job. Um, for most people that I know, the idea that you have some freedom to develop your own ideas and projects is one of the integral um, attractive qualities for working in a creative industry. Um, the idea of developing artistic products um, very hand, in a very hands-on way can be very attractive. Um, and using creative, I think, I can't quite see what that is, but to do your to job. So I think that's modalities or mm -hmm. um, creative tools to do your job. And working with a creative team, I've worked with more than a couple of um, students who say in order to keep their art practice alive, um, they need to be around other people who are doing creative things. And um, an example that comes to mind of a, a painting student who went to work for a company in Portland called Gam Gablin, Gamblin Paints, which is an old paint mixing company, company. And they mix paints for interiors and exteriors. And even though his job is very much a customer service role, he's working with color and, um, and, he's, and it's giving him a creative boost that's keeping his own painting career alive. And he gets a big discount on paint, so. <laughs> He likes that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. So, um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about how do you even know sort of like what to pursue? So um, this is really, this is going to be like the world's quickest overview of, of career development and really how I work with students. And I know how all of our advisors really work with students when it comes to um, career development and identifying goals and potential um, directions for the future. So I think there's two really important pieces of this. One is self-knowledge and one is career knowledge. So um, we'll talk about self-knowledge first. So really it's just knowing, knowing who you are and what you want. So, um, but there's several pieces to this. I think it's really important to think about career um, from a holistic perspective. So not just looking at one thing, not just looking at what you're good at, but what are you good at? So what are your skills? What do you feel competent doing? Um, what are you interested in? What keeps your interest and, and, and keeps you feeling intellectually um, engaged in the work that you're doing? How about your personality? So um, knowing 
Do you need to be around people in your job? Um, is that something that is really important to keep you energized? Are you somebody that really likes uh, doing work that involves a lot of fine details? Are you more of a big picture kind of a person that really likes to look at, at larger themes? Um, are you strategic and future oriented in the work that you do? Or do you like to use your hands and be very here and now? Um, and in the artistic world, in the creative world, there's definitely room for all of those different personality types. There's, diff there's room for a lot of different skill sets. There's room for a lot of different interests. You know, you, we could be talking about music. We could be talking about graphic design. There's a lot of places to, to direct your energy. And then, of course, there's also your value system. And this is a big one, um, especially I find with students that are wanting some creativity in their work. Simply the value of being able to be creative and have freedom of thought and the freedom to to create new ideas and projects and, um, and be able to come up with new things. That's a value in and of itself. There's also values related to stability and stable benefits and health insurance and all of that kind of stuff. And all of those things are really important to think about. So the middle there, so, you know, spending some time, it's important to spend some time thinking about these different elements of career. And then in the middle there is that little circle that says well-informed decision. Sometimes you see versions of this uh, Venn diagram that say something like, dream job or life's passion, um, which can feel quite limiting and a little bit anxiety provoking for students. There's not just one job out there that, that you're gonna find right in the middle. Um, there's no career soulmate. There, is, um, there are probably plenty of things that you can pursue. And I think for students that are pursuing artistic work, you may pursue a few things at once even. So definitely important to know who you are know what's important to you and what are you going to prioritize? How are you going to um, find a combination of things that make sense for you? Okay. And then there's career knowledge. So you've got to know yourself, but you also have to know the market, right? And that's, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so, you know, what does a, how does a graphic designer's job look differently than an art director's job? Um, how does somebody working in museum curation, um, look different than somebody who's working in um, museum education. Um, so what kind of skills are needed for those jobs? What kind of a degree? Do you need a postgraduate degree? Do you not? Um, do you, um, are there special certifications that you could gain instead? Um, is there, what's the work setting? All of these things. So all of that career knowledge is information that you can find sometimes online um, through uh, websites like ours, um, through professional organization websites, oftentimes have really outstanding uh, sets of resources for students and people who are looking to join or to pursue that career. And then also informational interviews, which we'll hopefully have time to talk a little bit about at the end. But an informational interview is essentially just talking to somebody who's doing work that you think seems interesting. So those are all ways to gain career knowledge. And then also simply doing the work. Um, if you've never worked in an art gallery and you wanna look and you know, see what that really does look like, how that feels to you, um, you know, trying to find some hands-on ways to gain that career knowledge as well. So those are the two, it's again, a very fast <laughs> version of, of what career development kind of looks like. Oh, sorry. Okay, and then one last little note here before I turn it back over to, to Lynn that I think is really important to talk about is the notion of what I call career fluidity, um, which is basically, I think, you know, this, a lot of times students will want to choose a major or choose a career and have a very linear line between their major and their career or the career that they choose and the way that their uh, career trajectory goes throughout their life. Um, so that linear line is the fiction. The reality is that loop-de-loopy kind of line. And I think, you know, especially in the world of art and creative careers, it's important to know that even if you move to different industries, even if you, um, you know, engage in some artistic work for a while, 
then maybe a non-artistic job, but then maybe you go back to an artistic job. There's a lot of different ways to make this happen. Um, I was just telling Lynn a little bit ago about um, a, a coworker of mine from a while back who had started their career in graphic design. Um, and then ended, I ended up working with her as, um, as a fellow career advisor and as somebody working in career development um, at a university. And while she wasn't being paid as a graphic designer at that particular time in, in her career, we had, I mean, the most beautiful marketing and promotional um, products that, that, that I'd seen in a university. Everything from the fonts that she used to the graphics that she used to the super, to the students that she was able to supervise that she would pull from the art department and the graphic design um, major to help us with our projects. So she was still able to engage in her graphic design work, even when she was doing something that may have seemed to other people like it was unrelated. So there's lots of loop-de-loops. Um, you can, but you can take a career step without necessarily knowing where it's going to lead you. And that's, I, um, I love that story. And you know, <laughs> yeah. I really do. And in fact, you know, um, that promotional piece is something that really helps any career this you know it, it is really important to get the word out and um we i think uh the willamette team does a really good job of getting the word out but um it's still it's still a big part of how students find out and um when i've talked to anna or rosa prior to this um she said that in her undergraduate experience it, it, she didn't really feel like she had access to the career development that we offer students um, now. And I th think getting the word out and promotion is a big part of it. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. So Len, I'm going to let you take it away here for a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about um, so I mentioned already that creative career paths uh, may look different than what we've been taught to believe that jobs look like you start you keep going you retire so how do creative jobs look a little bit different um one of the things that i find fascinating is that um most of our uh current students will probably uh, work in a number of different ways sometimes all at the same time um, there's a model where a student has a a base job, a, a pretty steady job, but they also are accepting freelance contracting, freelance contracts. There's ways to bring art into almost any corporate job. Um, and the example that you gave about the graphic designer in career services is wonderful, but I was also thinking about even in a job like working for the state or something, if you um, are in a a position where you're doing presentations, you can make them artistic presentations and, and bring that creativity into the job. Um, the regular contract work is something that many, many people choose to do. Um, there's a type of flexibility that comes with that. And um, there's also a little bit of risk. Um, it, it may not have the, the benefits and the um, stability that, um, but for instance, a corporate job. And um, always being able to look at how you can infuse your artistic uh, interests and creativity into a different industry. And on the previous slide, Anne um, kind of suggested that um, going from a creative or artistic industry into something that, that maybe is not and back is one of the characteristic of today's labor market. And it was actually in play even before COVID, but I think in some ways it's going to be more evident as we reemerge from the pandemic. Um, I think people are looking at all sorts of different ways to get the work done. And it goes beyond the, the issue of virtual versus non-virtual. It's really a, a whole um, holistic way of looking at work. Okay. So. Okay, moving on. 
so I'll, I'll jump in here about designing your life. This became my, um, my favorite uh, study in, uh, in 2017, uh, right after Stanford University um, introduced a, a course called Designing Your Life. I ended up enrolling for the class and then just became fascinating in how we apply design theory to designing a career and is something that um, students in an art school seem to already kind of know instinctively, but I found uh, business students that I've met with to also um, have a very open uh, idea about it. And one thing, one of the reasons I think it really works is because there is no right path there are many different possibilities and there are, they're called prototypes in the designing your life uh, system. And one of the things that I really get a kick out of is like looking at the prototypes as possibilities and then observing and helping a student observe where are they getting traction? They're trying this on, they're trying to find an internship with Nike, um, they've applied for the internship, they followed up. How's it going? Are they getting close to that? If there's, if there's no traction, then it's time to look at another prototype and try another way in. And that is actually how students can move through a, a process in a very creative way. Um, there are these five different tenets of the designing your life process, and they're so simple but it's so true that um, in any of these things, you wanna be curious and curiosity can be something like, well, why do you like your job? Um, and, and really ask a lot of questions, um, trying things on. Um, sometimes people are really surprised once they try something that they either really like it or they don't like it. And my favorite way for students to try it is with internships because they're getting credit for the experience. Uh, we structure it in a way that's academically rigorous and they get a chance to really find out if this is the type of job they want. Do they wanna spend their time doing this? Um, the problems, the, the concept about reframing problems is just uh, fascinating to me. Um, you know, the, the problem might be I need a summer job um, and the reframe might be, well, what kind of skills and experience do you need to build your resume so that you're a more qualified applicant for the job you really want to do when you graduate? All of a sudden, it isn't a summer job anymore. It's something much different than that. Um, the, the whole thing is the process in the current statistics are that we're changing jobs about every three years now. And so if we can learn this process and become good at this process, as life, as we go through life and jobs change and opportunities happen, we're gonna become much better at, um, at designing our lives. Um, we really believe in our office that asking for help is the right thing. Um, we have a really robust uh, staff of advisors who all accept the designing your life as one of the um, one of the ways to support students in transitions. So um, I feel really good about that. This is part of our curriculum in our our career development office. And I think I'll just hop in for a second yeah. in there. And, um, you know, I think this goes back a lot to what I was talking about in terms of the fluidity piece. And, you know, when you're looking for a creative type career, so, um, you know, having some sort of prototype, how do you design that direction of what that looks like? And then maybe you try something, maybe you, for example, have an internship where you are doing um, creative marketing for um, Adidas or something like that. And maybe for you, that that doesn't feel like 
the right career direction for you. Maybe using your artistic skills in that corporate space isn't exactly where you want to go. So create you create a new prototype. You create a new design. You design a different way of being creative in the work that you want to do. And so being able to be flexible and nimble that way, I think is is part of looking for a satisfying and rewarding creative career. One of my favorite recruiters in Portland use, uses the word flexitude pretty regularly when she describes the quality that employers want students to have. Um, and that's being open to possibilities and um, willing to learn new things and not be rigid in the parameters of what they're going to be doing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we thought it would be helpful. So we've talked a little bit, um, you know, in, in theory for a little bit. So let's look at some actual examples of creative jobs. And so, um, Lynn, do you want to talk a little bit about these? I believe these are all active job mm -hmm. postings right well, now. I think what's interesting, and even just as a research piece for my students, um, I like them to jump in and look at job descriptions and then evaluate, am I interested in this? Am I qualified for this? What would it take for me to be qualified for it? And so um, I used the three different job boards that I think are uh, most useful for creative jobs in the Portland labor market. And the first one is Handshake, the proprietary uh, software that Willamette uses and curates very well a list of jobs that our students uh, will likely be qualified for when they graduate. And I don't know if there's, how many like daily jobs are there? Like thousands? I mean, there's a lot. It changes very, it changes frequently. So um, I always tell students that if you hop onto Handshake and you don't see something one day, it doesn't mean that you won't find something the next day. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And there are also, um, internships too. Yes. And um, so um, the curator of the Japanese art museum um, was on Handshake, but I also found it on MaxList. And MaxList is a, is a curated job board um, that is mainly West Coast, but there is a particular focus in Portland. And there's a, they specialize in creative jobs and they, um, they have a tremendous number of jobs and internships that are um, uh, changing all the time. And they usually have some like hot jobs. Um, and so I, I, that's, and the third, um, the third job board that I'm looking at all the time is Pipeline PDX. And they also claim to have uh, creative jobs. They also will have some what I don't think are very creative jobs, plumbers and pipe fitters and things like that on the site, but they, the vast majority are um, creative jobs. Uh, the resident art mentor was a really interesting um, position for um, either an undergraduate or a recent grad where room and board was covered plus um, an hourly stipend for teaching art in a residential uh, community. It was a way to bring art into a community. And it was a, it's a grant position. And this one, I think was on uh, the resident art mentor was on both um, max list and PDX pipeline. Um, emergency, uh, the emerging talent associate. This is a music job. It's a music curator job. And it was, it's a really exciting job. And it showed up on handshake on Friday. Um, the annual giving coordinator is kind of an example of how actually like donor relations and all that is, it's not necessarily um, that creative when it boils down to it, but it can be if it's for, uh, if, if it's for an organization in the arts. In other words, you'll be mostly talking with people that are artists or interested in the arts. And so this was a, this was a job that I thought kind of combined both. Um, a regular uh, fundraising job with an art job. I think it, I love that list, Lynn, because I think, um, you know, you see so many different transferable skills there too. So, you know, for a student, for example, who is nervous that 
well, I like the idea of an artistic, creative kind of career, but you know, I don't have necessarily art skills. Well, working for a, you know, maybe an artistic nonprofit that puts you around those, that community, um, even if you aren't necessarily an artist, a musician, um, something like that, um, there are still ways to immerse yourselves in those work environments and be around um, creative mm -hmm. people too. So, and I mean, the transferable skills here, I mean, there's several, I mean, there's management, there's, um, you know, there's networking, there's um, helping skills and, and mm -hmm. mentorship skills. Uh, there's project management. I mean, there's all these different, you know, great transferable skills that students could have developed in a lot of places across campus um, that would make them competitive for these jobs, whether they were an art major of some kind or not. So thank you. Man. I love that list. Okay. Um, okay. So we're going to make this um, even more um, concrete. And Lynn's going to talk about a student that that she's worked with. Well, I'm going to actually say that Lauren was already a graduate. She'd already graduated okay. from um, PNCA when I started, but she was one of the first people I met when I started because she was really interested in um, like what my approach was going to be and second of all, how she could help. And so one of the things that I think is fascinating about Lauren is that she is a hands-on artist. She's a printmaker. She can do sculpture, drawing. She can actually do just about anything. But what she is choosing to do for her day job is she is the manager of the Portland made store in the Pearl. And so she has 220 artisans and makers that she works with all day, every day to help them in their um, careers and be able to make a living uh, selling in the store. And when I've talked with her, I, I'm, just, I'm just delighted with the fact that she absolutely loves her work. It's so energizing that she has time to sit on the Willamette Alumni Board. She's also on another nonprofit board very uh, involved in the community. And she has continued with her art practice. And um, even just in the last couple of days, I was able to refer a student to her for an informational interview. And so she she's an artist who gives back all the time and it's clearly energizing to her. And um, I'm, just, I'm just really happy to have her in my professional circle. So and I that's think yeah, and so that's just, you know, at the at the beginning of the presentation, when we talked about sort of the the different ways of combining artistic work. So, you know, there's freelance, there's, um, you know, contract work, there's piecing together different elements of, of artistic work. So, you know, maybe you are somebody who teaches a given type of art or music or writing or whatever. And then you also do your own creative pieces on the side. So um, there are, you know, a number of ways to, you know, maintain your own artistic practice and vision and, and still, um, and have a rewarding career that you, that you go to every day too, so. And she, she really is a leader. She probably wouldn't say that about herself, but in every group that I've ever been in with her, she, is, she takes on a leadership role. And um, it's, it's just something that's wonderful to be around. I think it also speaks to the, you know, the importance of continuing to gain transferable skills in addition to some of the specific hard artistic skills. So um, she has to be not only an artist and somebody who knows good art um, to sell in her store, but is also able to manage people and stay organized and encouraging mm -hmm. and, and all of those, those good old transferable skills that can take you from industry to industry. So I do think that, um, you know, pursuing creative work is important to also um, pursue some of those other transferable skills that, that make you employable. Okay, so moving on. So here are a couple more examples of active job posts. Um, I think these were ones that I had found maybe. Um, and and um, 
we wanted to, Lynn and I wanted to show sort of, you know, two active posts that are very different in the way they look. So in practicality. So the one on the left, this arts program educator at a camp. I mean, this is somebody who I like the way Lynn said this earlier, we were chatting about this and she said, who really has their hands in the paint. So, um, you know, somebody who's, who's really doing um, art as a part of the job. Whereas this one on the other side, um, associate designer at IBM, these are things that are, you know, perhaps more digital in focus, um, but do allow for collaboration and design work. So, you know, if you look at these two jobs in actuality, they're, they both look quite different, um, but are different ways of looking at creative work. Did you want to add anything to that, Lynn? Well, I just, the one on the right, I think just um, is, it's a corporate job. It's going to have corporate structure. It's going to have a higher uh, salary. And some students that I'm working with would just be totally turned off by that. But there are others who have that skill set and actually kind of long for a little more structure um, in order to free up their creative uh, mind to do the work that they really want to do. So I think it's such an individual thing. And that's why I think uh, career advising is so important with the with the artists. Yeah, it goes back to that self-knowledge piece and the value system and what's important to you and knowing knowing what kind of environment is important for you to have. Okay. Okay, so the last area that we wanted to cover was talking a little bit about um, how to market yourself and how to look for opportunities and, um, and, and find a network of people that are doing the kind of work that you wanna do as well. So we talk a lot in career development about resumes. It's hard to get, it's hard to get away from it, but there are actually quite a few um, ways to make a resume seem a little bit more interesting. So I always tell students that if you are applying for, um, even if it's in the corporate landscape, if you're applying for a job that requires you to be um, a designer, if it requires you to be creative, you want your resume to convey that, right? This is your first opportunity to convey that brand. So I'm gonna show just a couple of different examples of slightly more stylized resumes. Um, so this is one example. Um, so here you have, and I've just found these online. I apologize that my dog is barking in the background. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is um, just a little bit more stylized than like a resume template that you might find um, through, you know, um, through, through an online search or something like that, or just using a Microsoft Word document. Um, but it's still easy to read. I can still easily identify this person's experiences and their education. I can find everything quickly, um, but it just, when I look at it, I immediately think this is a person with an eye for design of some kind. Here's another one that's a little bit like that. This one has a picture. I don't necessarily recommend having a picture, although these days it's you know easily findable on LinkedIn and, and all kinds of places. Um, but this one looks, I think, kind of interesting. So, and then there's one other um, that I wanted to show if I can find it. Yeah, Lynn, you had, um, I I'm gonna look. Notes. Yeah, Bailey. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna let you talk about this one for just a second here okay. while the dog finishes barking. Um, well, the, the one that, this one really appeals to me, um, and I guess it's um, it's actually developed by the career development team um, at Willamette. And I had been using one that was slightly different, but one of the things I really appreciate about this one is kind of the big deal for most students is the fact that they're either a student or a recent grad. And so by placing education at the top and then following right after that with experience, you have the ability to do a, um, to cut and paste keywords into the template. And most of the recruiters say that the top half of the first page is the high value real estate in the resume. And so this resume really um, 
allows you to insert keywords that match the job description in a very strategic way. I just, I like the, the lines on this resume. I like the white space around it. Um, the little dash of color does speak to a creative resume. And then the skills down below are another um, great opportunity to cut and paste keywords. And when I say cut and paste keywords, I in no, may, in no way mean falsify what you know how to do or what you've learned. Um, it's just a way to sometimes in a job description, a particular uh, skill is called one thing that might be different than what you call it. But for example, you could use it could be, well, a really common one is um, the Adobe Creative Suite. And maybe you call it something different, um, but if they call it the Adobe Creative Suite, call it that in your skill set. Um, just, just mimic exactly what they say. Um, so that's, that's why I've become particularly fond of this, this, this resume. Although I like the other ones you, you saw too. And I, I like that little punch of yellow on the first one. I kind of think that's a little energizing too. Yeah, and I think what it all comes down to is, I mean, it really is, you know, demonstrating that you have these skills, even, even in the context of your resume, it should be, it should be evident there. Um, it still needs to be readable and, um, and it still needs to be easy for the employer or whoever you're sending your resume to, to quickly and efficiently read your material. If you do a Google search sometimes for creative resumes, you can see some, <laughs> some pretty, uh, yeah, some pretty unusual stuff. And so I think, you know, writing that line of demonstrating that you have an eye for, for design or creativity, um, but also keeping it accessible to most employers is really important. So um, I also did um, for anyone there's the link that I that I pasted there has some um, some great tips on creating resumes for creative careers as well. Um, so the other thing that um, we wanted to just touch on quickly was uh, networking skills. So I'm not sure. I mean, networking is crucial in pretty much any career. Um, but you know, I think that I have found that for students that are artistic and creative, it is, it's all the more important that, um, that they um, find their network, find mentors, find people who have done creative jobs um, and who have found their way throughout that landscape um, to offer advice and to, to have role models and to have mentors in that area. So, um, so the easiest way to do that is through an informational interview. I talk about these all the time. I talk about them, whether you're studying physics or chemistry or studio art, it's a great skill to have um, no matter what you're interested in. Um, but I do think when you know, you might have to come up with a, a non-traditional way of pursuing your artistic and creative, you know, ideals and also, you know, paying the bills, um, having mentors that you can talk to. So an informational interview, which we have a lot of information about this on our website, um, basically just entails finding somebody, whether it's through LinkedIn or through a professor or through some personal network of some kind, um, finding somebody who's doing the kind of work that you want to do, and then asking them how they got there. Um, what were some of their first steps out of college? What were some of the things that they did when they were in college? Um, and people are really actually quite receptive to this. So um, I'll use an artistic example, um, but I have a student who really wants to be uh, working in the fashion industry right now and um, was having trouble identifying a Willamette alum doing that work. So I hopped on LinkedIn and I found somebody in the Portland metro area doing fashion merchandising for um, a trendy children's clothing brand. And um, I contacted them and said, can you talk to this student? And they said, sure, here's my email. I mean, it's, and I make that sound really easy. There are definitely times where I've had students reach out to people and they've been ignored or they've been, um, haven't gotten a response, but more often than not, people are willing to help college students. So if you're trying to figure out, okay, I love to illustrate. 
and I want to illustrate children's books, but I don't even know how to get started. You know, finding the people who are doing that work and making a living, living illustrating people who are making a living, um, you know, teaching music or whatever it is, um, we can we can look stuff up and Google things all day long, but especially when you're looking for these non-traditional paths and these creative ways of piecing together artistic jobs, finding the mentors and talking to people is really um, is really invaluable. I, that was a little bit of a soapbox. I, I can feel that <laughs> as I'm talking. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Lynn. Well, it's interesting. I think you were channeling my afternoon because I had a, a guy reach out to me and he just published or he's he's all ready to publish a children's book, but he's looking for a student illustrator. And so um, because it's a one one off project, I put it on our internal portal that our students will be able to see and he'll he'll get a lot of response for that. Yeah. And um, so what a student wants to do in a case like that is send a resume cover letter, a brief uh, letter of interest, and then a link to a portfolio that the art, the, the author can see very quickly if it's a match with what he has in mind for this project. Um, and my guess is um, he'll, he'll have plenty to choose from by tonight. And I think, you know, that also, I like that example for another reason too, and this is another thing, um, the next bullet there is opportunities for professional development. So as a student, um, it is, I think, especially again, you know, sort of early on trying to embrace and harness this idea of piecing together different ways of gaining experience um, is that, you know, take the perspective of no, um, that even small jobs are going to be really, really effective and really important for your resume and your professional development. So even if it's a one-off poster or promotional campaign, even if you are um, only doing one t-shirt design, even if it, for a one event, um, you know, whatever it is, those are really important things for a portfolio and for a resume. Um, one submission to a literary magazine, uh, you know, even if it doesn't feel like, oh, this is a big internship at a corporate company where I show up from eight to five every day. That's not necessarily um, the reality for a lot of creative work. So embracing that ability to say, I will take on this project, you know, connect with student organizations, connect with nonprofits who need help doing that kind of work um, or seeing if there are obviously paid opportunities to do that work as well. But those are really great ways to, to build that portfolio early on. One thing that we don't really talk a lot about in our, um, in our curriculum is we do really want to develop um, strong professional references along the way. And sometimes these um, professional contacts that you make that maybe turn into a mentoring um, role or something can end up being really good professional references once you start a strategic job search. So it's it's kind of nice to keep that in mind. Um, you know, some people will ask faculty to be a professional reference. Sometimes that's totally appropriate. Sometimes it's kind of a stretch because the, the faculty member may not know that student very well. Um, so it's, it's better to probably develop some other people working in the industry you're interested in who can, um, can be that professional reference. That's my soapbox today. Yeah. <laughs> so the last thing that I'll just touch on very briefly, um, is the importance of researching companies. So, um, this is something that you can easily do on company websites, um, looking in um, Googling organizations to see how they come up in the news, um, but also looking at their profiles on things like LinkedIn. So if you have a LinkedIn account, um, it can be really helpful to just look at how that company is presenting itself. So I'll use a, a very obvious um, example here for a second. Um, where did my... Um, well, I've lost my tab, but you're going to understand as soon as I explain it. So if you hop on LinkedIn, 
and go to the company profile for an organization that you're interested in. And you look at their about page. So I did this today with Etsy and it will not shock you to know that if you go to the Etsy LinkedIn page um, and click on about, you're gonna see pictures of people creating art. You're gonna see people wearing casual clothes. You're gonna see people working on their computer with their dog in their lap. Um, there's a lot of obvious imagery and articles and branding that demonstrates that that is a creative organization and they're looking for creative people. So it's really important to, you know, when you're doing your informational interviews, ask those questions, ask the people working for those companies, what opportunities there are for creativity um, and look to see how they present themselves in their recruiting um, spaces, because that'll give you an idea too of, of what kinds of opportunities there are for that. So we're at about the one hour mark, and I just want to make sure that um, that we have a take a second to kind of wrap up. And um, I don't know, Lynn, do you have any like final words of wisdom for our for our students watching this? <laughs> um, I think the only other thing, and I think you actually had it on the slide, was figuring out uh, professional organizations you can join as a student. Usually the um, the fee to join a professional organization is very low for students. You can get involved in volunteer uh, activities, planning events, but it's it's one of the best networking um, things you can can do. And um, so that would just be one other um, one other recommendation. And we can help you find the professional organizations that line up um, with your particular um, interest too. Absolutely. Good example of that. I'm always trying to encourage my students that are creative writers to get involved in um, the Willamette Writers Conference that happens in Portland every every summer, um, where they can actually, you know, all they have to do is volunteer at the event, and then they can, um, you know, get the opportunity to meet with agents and editors and things like that yeah. if they're creative writers. So there's, that's just one example of those kinds of things. So, so I just want to Literary arts is also in Portland. Yes. And, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can uh, students can get free um, free stuff by volunteering to be ushers and all that at events. So there you kind go. Of fun. Yeah. So all of this is to say that um, Lynn and myself and all of our career advisors are comfortable and happy to talk with you about. Um, either evaluating an option to see if it would offer the kind of creativity that you're interested in, or to help you come up with ways to pursue the kind of art that you want um, and in a way that feels comfortable to you from your value system and all of that. So, um, you know, definitely book a, uh, a career advising appointment with us if you would like, um, and you can do those on Handshake. So for, for all students, Willamette, PNCA, and um, yeah, we thank you for, for joining us. Thank you.